Okay, we're going to look at theme 1E for the Christianity section of the course. And this theme is entitled The Early Church, specifically in Acts of the Apostles. And really, uh, this theme comes in two parts. It looks at the work of C.H. Dodd and then of Rudolf Bultmann. In this PowerPoint, I'm going to concentrate specifically on C.H. Dodd. But first of all, I'm going to give you a general introduction to the theme. So, this section of the syllabus is really concerned with whether or not the early church got Jesus right. What do we mean by that? Well, did they represent Jesus in the way he wanted to be represented? Or, when the apostles proclaimed the message about Jesus, did they twist and distort his message to suit their own purpose? Remember, Jesus dies round about 33, 34 CE. Um, the apostles continue the work of the church onwards throughout the first century. The first book of the Bible, probably Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, is written round about 55 CE. The Gospels 80 CE onwards. So they're a good 45 years after the death of Jesus. So did they get it right? You know, and the whole topic is linked to this concept of kerygma. Have to know this word, guys. It's, and the word kerygma literally means a proclamation or an announcement or a declaration of an event. The plural of kerygma is kerygmata. And so when you're referring to two or, one or, more, pas uh, two or more passages, you refer to it as kerygmata. Uh, in terms of how the textbook works uh, for this course, they just use kerygma, but kerygmata is the plural. So the first philosopher or theologian to criticize the early church was this guy, Hermann Samuel Rimarus in the um, 16th century, or well, 16th, yeah, 16th century. So he was the first thinker to accuse the disciples of changing the views of Jesus. Rimarus believed that Jesus held a view that was held by many Jews at the time, and this was that the world was about to end. The Jews have come back from Babylon, they've re-established they've re um, the temple, etc. And then they're invaded by Rome, they're under Roman subjugation, and a large quantity of Jews thought that the new kingdom of God was coming with the Messiah at the head. This would be um, a real kingdom on earth with God ruling, the Romans would be kicked out, the end of the world was coming. So this view was known as Jewish apocalypticism have to know that phrase because later on C.H. Dodd links these ideas in. And Rimarus, you're wondering why I've got fishing stinks down there, you're soon going to find out. Rimarus said that the disciples removed that apocalyptic viewpoint of Jesus. They changed the message into a set of timeless spiritual truths. And they did this because, or so Romarus believes, because they, the world didn't end. They were fully expecting the world to end. It didn't. Therefore, they faked Jesus' resurrection and found a new religion in order to avoid going back to their jobs as fishermen. So basically, how this is seen is Jesus is almost like a, a revolutionary who is thinking to overthrow the Romans by um, some form of uprising, some revolt. It's a complete failure. Jesus ends up being crucified and killed. The disciples are fully assuming the world is going to end. Their movement is shattered. And then because the world doesn't end, they distort the message so that it becomes a set of timeless truths, a new world religion. Because quite frankly, they don't go, want to go back to the Sea of Galilee and end up fishing. So it's a devastating critique. And many scholars, surprisingly, disagree with it. But Others think that Rymarus might be onto something. So let's move on. During the mid 20th century, when the, there was a big debate about what the literary genre of the New Testament was, scholars such as C.H. Dodd and Rudolf Bultmann, which is why we're looking at these two in this section of the course, suggested that the Gospels were of a genre unique in the ancient world. And they called this genre kerygma, 
and described it as a later development of preaching that had taken a literary form. So what they mean is they're, they're looking at preaching, speeches, orations that have been given directly by the apostles to the crowd that are listening, and then it becomes a literary form. Now, some scholars have found problems with Bultmann's theory, but in biblical and theological discussions, kerygma has become to does come to denote that key essence of the Christian apostolic teaching. So kerygma is that essence of what the apostles were preaching about Jesus. When we use the word kerygmatic, it's expressing the message of Jesus's whole ministry. So as I said, a proclamation, but it's not addressed to theological reason. So unlike scripture, so some people would say you read this book, you, you look at the passages and it's like teaching. You have to understand, you have to be taught it, you have to interpret it. That is what you do with this book. That's some, somewhat different from kerygma because kerygma is a direct preaching, a direct pronouncement to a personal you. So as I put here, the proclamation is addressed not to theoretical reason. It's not for you to try and interpret, work out. It's directly to the hearer as an individual, as a self. So you're not thinking about didactic use of scripture. You're not looking at trying to understand. That's what we mean by kerygma, kerygmatic. And of course, the cross, the resurrection are key to this concept. So let's look at some key verses here that look at um, kerygma. Just going to have a swig of tea here. It's early in the morning. So here's Jesus directly speaking. And he's actually reading from the prophecy of Isaiah. And as you can see here, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind to set the oppressed free. Now, the really important bit here is the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news. The word gospel literally means good news. Think about that idea of being possessed by the Holy Spirit proclamation, because that is going to link to the two key kerygmatic verses that you need to know for this part of the syllabus. Second verse we can look at. Uh, this is St Paul speaking. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can you hear without someone preaching to them? So this idea of preaching, proclamation, kerygma is key. So there he is, C.H. Dodd. He was born um, April the 7th, 1884, a New Testament scholar. And he was known for promoting realized eschatology. Now, eschatology is anything that refers to the end of times, the, the, the apocalypse. Realized eschatology is what Dodd taught. So we'll go into that in a little more detail later on. So what he's saying is, in a nutshell, when Jesus is referencing the kingdom of God, he's referring to a kingdom that exists in the present and not in the future. So it's not at the end of times Armageddon, which is what Jewish apocalypticism thought was happened. You know, with the coming of the kingdom of God, the world would end effectively, end of times. But what we're talking about here is the kingdom of God is something that's in the present. It doesn't come at the end of time, it's not in the future. So in his book, The Apostolic Preaching and Its Developments, Dodd drew a clear distinction between preaching and teaching. Okay, The aim of his book was basically to inquire how far is it possible to discover the actual content of the Gospels preached, of the Gospel preached by the Apostles. So how far can you dig into the text of this book and find out what the kerygma was? And he started by looking at Paul's writings, as of course Paul was the earliest Christian writer. And Paul, as and Dodd says, well, Paul himself at least believed that in essentials his gospel was that of the primitive apostles. So what Dodd's saying is there, and it's quite clear that Paul thought 
the charisma he was preaching, the key message he was preaching, was exactly the same as the first apostles, the, the ones that were side by side and knew Jesus. And Dodd tried to reconstruct that message, that charisma, that proclamation, and argued that this could be found in the speeches in the Acts of the Apostles. Now, there are numerous speeches in Acts of the Apostles, and we know the writer of Acts was the same writer as who wrote Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and we've got speeches from Peter, we've got speeches from the first uh, Christian martyr, Simon, um, we've got uh, Stephen, I mean, sorry, I beg your pardon, Stephen, not Simon, and we've got numerous speeches by Paul. But the syllabus asks you to concentrate on two specific speeches that are by Peter, but there are other Pauline ones and ones from Stephen as well. So let's remember that Dodd points out you don't confuse charisma with teaching or historical facts. It's an announcement. It's a proclamation. So when the disciples are presenting their message about Jesus publicly, because all these speeches are in public to a crowd of people that are listening, they don't they don't deliver a lecture, but they herald an event. It's slightly different. They are talking about an event that is going to happen. And Dodd also says you don't you shouldn't think of the New Testament as a memoir, because at its heart there's this bold set of claims that confront its readers with a decision. Remember, it's not a lecture, you've got to take action. It's about an event that's got to happen. Now I've put what decision is he referring to, and the answer is it's in these two set texts from Acts. And hopefully you'll see that as we go through them. You know, what is that decision that the listener is confronted with? The listener, the ancient crowd back 2000 years ago that are listening to Peter, that are listening to Paul, that are listening to Stephen. What are they confronted with? What action must they take? What is what is the charisma demand of them? And Dodd also warns against seeing the New Testament as an ethical guide. So he's saying those speeches and acts in them, you're confronted with truths. And it's about experience of transformation as a result of accepting those truths. So I'm hinting at what the answer to my question above is. So the book of Acts, written by the same author as the Gospel of Luke, shows the progression of the Christian message from Jerusalem throughout the Roman Empire, spread by Paul, and then ends up with the gospel coming to Rome itself with Paul. And in Acts chapters two and three, we encounter the first of many speeches by the apostles. And Dodd thinks these speeches share the main idea that basically God's plan for salvation, which has unfolded throughout the Jewish scriptures, throughout the Old Testament, has reached fulfillment in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And this plan hasn't ended, it continues, say the apostles, by the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. And what makes these speeches so interesting is that they are the first public message of a tiny group of Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And this tiny message, like a, an acorn grows into an oak tree, hence my image here, this tiny message grows into the largest worldwide religion on the planet. So what was that charisma? Now, can't stress enough, you need to know the following six elements. Pause for a cup of tea. So Dodd says, basically, if you look at charisma, you've got six key themes and you can pick out these six, these six key themes. Now, what I've done is I've colour coded these. Um, it's an inexact science. There's bits that you could argue go into more theme than another. But basically, I've colour coded the six themes for you. So the first theme is the idea that this age of fulfilment has dawned. So the prophecies of the Hebrew prophets about the coming of a new age. They are used by the apostles to explain that this new age is here and the signs of that new age are the miracles the crowds are witnessing. Most of these speeches occur just after a miracle has happened. The second theme, which I've colour coded in red, is the idea that this new age has come about through the ministry, through the death, through the resurrection of Jesus, and that the power 
of Jesus is behind these events. And that's confirmed by the fact that Jesus is descended from David. Um, he can conduct miracles. He conducted miracles during his ministry. God used his unfair death at the hands of men for his greater purpose. And Jesus is raised from the dead. All these are um, signs of that power. Okay, that confirm that this event has occurred. The third theme is in green, and that is that Jesus has ascended to the right hand of God, which confirms that he is the Messiah, the head of the new Israel, the new head of the new kingdom of God. The fourth theme, in a sort of light purple, uh, is that God's Holy Spirit has been poured out on the church. So that is now a sign of Christ's power and glory. Theme five in blue is the idea that Christ will soon return to bring the Messianic age to its full consummation. And in a sort of slightly off green, the theme that everyone should repent so their sins can be forgiven, so that they can receive the Holy Spirit and so that they can participate in the special new life of the church. Now, I'm not going to read through some very, very lengthy speeches in Acts, but what I've done in the PowerPoint I've put them up for you and I've done the colour coding so you can pause and go through and get your head round these key speeches. You have to know them, guys. Now, that's not expecting you to learn them off by heart, but you've got to know the key themes that come out and you've got to know how they relate to these six um, themes that um, Dodd has highlighted. So the first um, passage is Acts chapter 2 verses 14 to 39 and this is Peter speaking to the crowd. Now the important thing to realise and just to put this into context because I'm not going to read through the whole passage is that just prior to this speech the disciples have received the Holy Spirit for the, for the first time. So this is the speech at Pentecost in the morning after the disciples have started to receive they've received the Holy Spirit they started to speak in tongues in numerous languages there's a big crowd of people in Jerusalem from numerous different countries some recognize their home language other people can't recognize anything and have sort of started to question the disciples and say you know what's going on here they're babbling they're talking gibberish um, are these people drunk and that's the context by which Peter stands up raises his voice and as he says, addresses the crowd and, you know, states these people are not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. And then the proclamation starts. OK, so as you can see, as I run through the next few slides, um, Peter is speaking to the crowd. He refers to Old Testament prophecy. He's quoting uh, the prophet Joel. He then exhorts the listeners, the Israelites, to listen um, and talks about Jesus being a man accredited by God. He talks about miracles. He talks about God's deliberate plan, Jesus being wrongfully put to death, Jesus being raised from the dead. He then refers to Jesus's Davidic origins. He refers to Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. or Old Testament quotation there. Back to Davidic origins with this bit. Back to the resurrection, God raising Jesus to life, back to the right hand of God. And then this idea of receiving the Holy Spirit comes through. Back to David again, more prophecy. Back to references to Jesus being Lord and Messiah. And then this very interesting passage right at the bit, when confronted by this huge proclamation, this kerygma, the people hear it, they're cut to the heart, they say to Peter and the apostles, what shall we do? What must they do when confronted with the kerygma? And here's the key bit. And this is the bit you basically need to know. Peter replies, repent, be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins receive the Holy Spirit and this promises for you and your children for all who are far off 
for all whom the Lord God will call me. So there are your key things. So what does the Christian make you do? You've got to make a decision when confronted with it. Are you going to repent? Are you going to baptize, be baptized? Are you going to receive the Holy Spirit? Are you going to embrace this new message? The next text occurs um, is Acts 3, 12 to 26. And the context of this is Jesus has just, um, sorry, Peter has just healed a crippled man, a man who cannot walk and has made him walk. So it is a response to a miracle. And once again, Peter is here addressing the Israelites. And you can again see as we go through the common themes that come through in this passage. And again, I've highlighted them in the various colours that link to the theme. So, you know, here we've got references to Old Testament, references to the Jews um, giving Jesus over to be crucified. You've got references to this miracle is because Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is working. You've got references back to the Israelites um, giving Jesus over. You're getting references to the fulfillment of the prophecies. And then you've got repent, turn to God so your sins may be wiped out. So there's that message again. OK, it's there. So you've got the rest of this text winding through all the six elements of there of the charisma that's Dodd, that Dodd has identified. And you can go back, study that in more depth, look at the colouring that I've put in, and hopefully that will help you. But hopefully you understand what that key message of the charisma is as a result of going through this. So, having looked at what the charisma may be, let's uh, consider some of the challenges to it. And the first challenge comes to raise the question, all right, if you're looking at did the disciples get Jesus right? The first thing you need to look at is the source you're using from this book, Acts of the Apostles, is it historically accurate? Because if it's not, then maybe they didn't get Jesus right. Maybe the charisma is all wrong. And so some scholars have viewed Acts as not being historical. It's more a literary product rather than a historical account. So the speeches delivered by Peter, Stephen or Paul are not real speeches that they deliver. They're summaries of the author's point of view. I've missed out an apostrophe on authors. I do apologise. OK, so the main arguments behind Acts of the Apostles not being an historical document are as follows. So if you're doing the evaluation section of this topic, these are the sort of things you need to get in. And so I'm going to give you the arguments against it being historical and then in follow-up slides you're going to get the arguments for the counter arguments so the first argument they use is well Luke is a Gentile therefore he clearly wasn't present at some or any of the events he's reporting and he certainly was not for the events of Acts 2 and 3 Peter's speeches those two set texts of the syllabus no way he was there so he couldn't have been accurate um, they make the point that Luke or Acts Luke's gospel and Acts of the Apostles probably written in the 80s 40 to 50 years after the events are reported, that means a loss of accuracy. They make the point that the book itself is really highly organised, which suggests that the material may have been changed from its original form in which it's existed. You know, Luke chops and changes things to organise a more coherent account. So therefore, it's not historical. They also point to the language that's used in the book. They say the language that's used is very characteristic of the author of Luke and Acts. But when we get to anything about Paul's preaching, and remember, we've got all of Paul's letters to compare it to, the preaching of Paul in Acts is very, very different from the style of his preaching in his letters. So what they're saying is that sounds much in the Acts accounts of Paul sound much more like Luke speaking and not Paul. Therefore, it's not historically accurate. And they also say that some of Paul's key themes in the, his letters, such as faith versus work, spiritual gifts, issues on keeping the law, they're just not there in his preaching in Acts, which suggests that it may not have been Paul's preaching. And of course, um, and this is more linked to uh, the criticism of Bultman, the events in Acts contain reports of miraculous events which are associated with ancient literature and legends, genre of the time, and not with a modern scientific age. So it's not historical. 
Now, the response to that is as follows. So the people are saying that's yeah, not historical. Here are the counter arguments. So the first thing that people would argue is that the events that are being spoken about in Acts were really public events wit witnessed by hundreds, if not thousands of people. They were known to be known by many. If Luke had got it wrong, if Luke had written them down incorrectly, there would have been a huge outcry. Therefore, it's much more likely that he's got it right. And then, of course, they argue that even though it was written long after the events it describes, there's really clear tradition that Luke accompanied Paul. You go through the, act, uh, the book of Acts and there's constant references in the travels of Paul to we went here, we went there, clearly showing that the author traveled with Paul. So he would have first hand accounts of the events he's describing. They are historical. You could also argue that there's a lot of detail in the narrative. So it's such that that would be difficult to imagine that it's completely made up. So, for instance, if we look at our first um, big speech from Peter, when he goes, these people are not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. You know, that little detail about it's only nine in the morning suggests an eyewitness account, not someone making it up. And of course, they also argue the counter argument to Luke chopping and changing things and orders is it's common for writers to arrange material in a certain order. Um, but that doesn't mean the material isn't historical. It is, it's inaccurate. It's just been put in a slightly different order. And of course, they also argue that an author brings their own vocabulary and language into writing. So what was Luke's primary purpose? Well, the primary purpose of Acts was to convey how the good news of Jesus spread through the work and message of the disciples into the um, into the known world. Um, and of course, how would it serve his purpose to completely ignore history if that's what he's doing? And they also make the point that the differences in presentation of Paul in Acts and in Paul's writings might be accounted for the fact that when Paul is writing in his letters, he's writing for a specific audience to a specific church. His public speeches are completely different. So you're comparing two completely different things. No wonder the style is different. Now, Dodd falls down, um, comes in with the with the response we've just looked at. He thinks Luke is an historical document. He's examined Paul's letters. He can see the main elements of the charisma is presented in Acts in them. He thinks Luke or the, or the author of Acts is a careful historian. And he says there's even two slightly different accounts of Paul's conversion, one that is given right early on in the um, book of Acts, then one where Paul talks about it later. And he argues that you would think that someone determined to create sort of this unified literary work would have reworked both of those into one consistent account. So that suggests actually it's much more accurate and historical. So Dodd concludes that Luke was personally acquainted with the apostles. He witnessed their preaching. He didn't have any need to make anything up because he had direct access to the messages of the early church. He spent time with Paul. He knew those who witnessed the birth of the church in Jerusalem. Therefore, what we've got in Acts is an historical account. So that's the debate about historicity. You can decide which uh, side of the coin you go on, which side of the fence you stand on, but you can use that in evaluation uh, type questions. But then we come to the debate, is this message irrelevant? If Jesus thought, or the disciples thought the world was about to end, well, we're 2000 years on. So the message to a message from a group of people that thought the world was about to end, is that relevant when we to us today, when the world clearly hasn't ended? So, in a nutshell, as I've just said, uh, you could argue that the kerygma of the apostles, it's irrelevant because Jesus believed the world would end in his lifetime with a sudden cataclysmic coming of God. And so Jesus should be viewed as an apocalyptic or eschatological figure, someone's concerned with the end of times. Okay. And so basically what Jesus thought, if you told this view, was his primary aim was to bring his generation to God before that judgment day. 
And Jesus never envisages that he's founding a church that would endure for centuries. He thinks the world's going to be over in a generation. So therefore, the Kriegler can't be relevant. Now let's look at some Bible passages that might suggest this. And I would have a few of these up my sleeve in the exam if I were you. So this is Jesus speaking. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, you could take that to mean that Jesus is referring to um, the apocalyptic eschatological end of days. However, you could also argue that if you believe that the kingdom of God is a much more spiritual thing that uh, is uh, in the present, in the here and now, you could argue the other way around. So it's quite a good little uh, verse because it could inter be interpreted both ways. Uh, you could look at this um, quote from the, uh, the letter of James. You too be patient, stand for, firm, because the Lord's coming is near. So little doubt that the Apostle James thought that the end of times was coming soon. Here in 1 Thessalonians, the earliest book of the New Testament, we've got Paul saying, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive, notice we who are still alive, and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will be with the Lord forever. Seems to hint at a uh, end of times that it was expected soon rather than later. So it could be argued that the book of Acts tells of a church that was still very much in the grip of this apocalyptic view. And even though Luke wrote several decades after the crucifixion, that early church still believed the world was about to end. You could argue that. And in fact, Albert Schweitzer, there he is, declared that the one thing that could be known about the historical Jesus was the very thing that made him irrelevant for today, that he believed in the imminent end of the world. So Schweitzer thinks discard the Kerygma because it's irrelevant. But Dodd thinks otherwise. He believed there was much more to Jewish apocalypticism in the preaching of Jesus and the early life of the church. He believed that it, he believed that it was very, very little had to do with the imminent return of Jesus. Most of that early life of the church is concerned with the experience of forgiveness, living in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the present rather than the future. So he's talking about the response to the charisma, that accepting of the Holy Spirit, sins being forgiven. He reckons that's what the, Holy, the church, the early church were focused on. They weren't so much focused on the end of times, eschatological Jewish apocalypticism, etc. The early Christians were focused on the joy they had in their experience of the risen Jesus in the community of church. Um, much more. They may have expected the world to end soon, but it wasn't a key focus. And that for Dodd explains why the church didn't fall apart as time went on, because the focus wasn't on the end of times. It was much more on community, living in the spirit, etc., etc. So this is where we get to this concept of realised eschatology, the belief that one does not have to wait to the end of the world to experience the fullness of God. It can be realized now and in the present. And this is key to Dodd's thinking. So the focus of the early church was on the power that God brought, the forgiveness, the community, the renewed hope. It wasn't on the end of the world. The fact that Jesus hadn't returned was simply not for Dodd significant for most Christians. And Dodd, did say that the Bible passages that refer to the end of the world, which we've looked at, and there are many more, should be viewed not as pictures of final judgment, but as an interpretation of the challenges that come to all when faced with the power of the charisma. Do you repent? Don't you repent? How do you stay sinless? Etc. And Dodd accepts that some passages do present an apocalyptic point of view. And he says, well, they should be viewed as a scatological fanaticism. It's always been on the fringe of the Christian church. 
You know, there are people that expect the end of the world to come. You only have to look at some groups in America who are fully expecting the end of the world to come soon. So Don accepts that that was on the fringes, but it wasn't the main message. Ultimately, for Dodd, at the heart of the Christian belief is the saving power of Jesus that can be experienced in this life. You do not have to wait. The kerygma is what Jesus announced in Mark 1.15. Here it is. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent. Believe the good news. So for Dodd, Jesus and the apostles were united by the same kerygma. So they have got Jesus right. Acts is correct. The disciples did not, as my Mara says, put a spin on it. The message is relevant whether or not the end of the world was about to occur. And finally, I've left you with this final slides with some quotes that you can use to support any essay you're writing on this subject. I've included one from Bortman, I've included one from Ryan Morris as well. So you can have a look at these at your leisure. I know if you're watching this on YouTube, um, my uh, my pictures in front of this quote, it says Paul himself at least believed that in essentials his gospel was that of the primitive apostles. And this one from Dodd reads, we have to inquire how far it's, in, it, sorry, we have to inquire how far it's possible to discover the actual content of the gospel preached or proclaimed by the apostles. I hope you found that informative. Goodbye.